All right. Today is Wednesday, February, what is it? 17th. Do we even count days anymore? As long as they go up, just like stunks. We don't care. Anyways, this is a post-market review and an analysis for the stock market activities today. We continue to monitor the situation over in Texas, the deep freeze that is turning into a disaster, costing human lives, animals' lives, and of course, adding more pressure on energy prices, leading inflationary pressures higher and higher by the day. And speaking of inflation, we received a lot of macro data regarding January retail sales, industrial production, and the PPI itself. So we'll go over that and a lot more during the headlines of the day segment. As far as the market action today, the market is starting to feel the threat from the rise in treasury yields. And we saw a gap lower in the morning, specifically steep declines in the Nasdaq. However, the dip buying appetite remains intact. And you saw dip buyers showing up and buying the indices and the market overall managed to close mixed to cover that and a lot more let's start our market coverage and here we go the dow industrial average closing in the green by 90.27 points or a gain of 0.29 percent the nasdaq the laggard of the day closing in the red down 82 points or a decline of 0.58 percent the s p 500 in the red down by 1.26 points or a decline of 0.3%. And what about the sector's performance for the day? Leading the pack and capturing the gold medal once again, energy. Meanwhile, we're not going to give any silver or bronze because all in all, the sectors were muted and the performances were pathetic with exception to energy. Matter of fact, leading the pack to the downside, technology was the biggest loser of the day followed by basic materials and real estate. Shifting to the futures market performance, and let's see what happened today. Crude oil, massive gains. Whether we're talking about the WTI over 2%, we know that the Permian base, the production is shut down for now. That will add more and more pressure to push the WTI prices higher. Likewise, we saw gains for Brent, Brent closing just slightly below the WTI. And what's going on with softs? We saw modest gains here for sugar, coffee, and cotton. Meanwhile, modest declines for lumber. However, we saw significant declines of 2% or so for both coca and OJ. And if you guys remember, I did a trade on OJ that I closed today in the morning. And the trade was pretty much playing a rebound in OJ futures from the 106 level all the way to the 115 levels. Today in the morning, OJ futures reached all the way to 114.95 before retreating lower when the next session started. My sell order was set at 115, so I missed closing my trade at 115 and I had to close it manually at around 113.45 meaning that I missed a few bucks here because I set my sell order at 115 and of course just to mess with me the futures went all the way to 114.95 and then retreated. All in all it was a great trade very profitable but the moral of the story here is when you set your sell orders make sure that you go a little lower than the price you intend to sell for. So you don't run into the same situation that I ran into this morning. And what about metals? We saw modest gains for silver, yet big declines once again for gold, platinum, copper, palladium, all declining for today. Gold remains the underperformer here. There are multiple reasons why gold is underperforming. Number one, the US dollar is rising. Number two, yields are rising. But the most important factor here is the psychology. Traders have a new shiny object in Bitcoin, and that is adding downward pressure and outflows, massive outflows from gold and silver positions. And when we talk about a rise in the US dollar, we usually see downward pressure on futures, specifically metals, crude oil, meats, and grains. Crude oil is the exception due to what's going on in Texas, but we are seeing metals, grains, and meats futures reacting accordingly to the upward move in the US dollar 
today. Losses in live cattle, feeder cattle, and lean hogs. Meanwhile, grains futures also suffered some declines, specifically for soybean oil and wheat futures. Meanwhile, we saw an ad performance to the upside for rough rice, oats, and canola futures. Canola futures remain very, very hot and elevated in prices. Moving on to the options market, the big casino. Let's see what's going on here. The casino remains muted. Not a lot of activity is going on. It is possible due to the shortened trading week. However, whether it is a shortened trading week or not, we do have options expiration this coming Friday. And we will probably see an uptick in the volume of options starting tomorrow. But for today, the volume was muted with very few exceptions. Coming up in number one, per usual Apple, with about 1.8 million contracts traded today, about 72% of those were calls. Palantir, number two, with a little over 800,000 contracts, about 64% of those were calls. Coming up in number three, Tesla, just a slight uptick in options buying, and we saw them buying the dip in Tesla via buying call options. This is an important development because it could be a baby step to build a short-term bottom for Tesla at these levels. It will all depend on the follow-up for the next few days. However, for today, Tesla traded at around 715,000 contracts. About 55% of those were calls. And we saw an uptick in options volume buying for Wells Fargo, AT&T. And the reason is we have news for Wells Fargo. We will cover that. And AT&T, of course, on the heels of Warren Buffett buying a stake in Verizon. Moving on to the unusual activities that took place in the options market today. Starting with the ticker STNE. This is for Stone Cold. This is a fintech company from Brazil. And somebody's buying the 85 puts, making a bearish call here, with an expiration date of February 26. And the expectation here that the name is going to decline over 10% by then. And they are paying about 50 cents a piece to enter this trade. That brings the total to about one million dollars what about the ticker ewj this is for the japanese etf we saw the nikkei breaking 30 years consolidation a lot of traders are placing bullish bets for the japanese etf betting that the upward momentum just started in this case somebody's buying the 76 calls expiration date march 19th with expectation that the japanese etf will rise over six percent by then and they paid about 25 cents a piece to enter this trade that brings the total all the way to about half a million dollars what about the ticker gsky this is for green sky it's a fintech software and we saw massive gains for the name today climbing over 18 percent and somebody is making a bet that the momentum will continue to the upside for this name by buying the seven and a half calls expiration date march 19th with expectation that the name is going to rally over nine percent by then and they paid about a buck and 40 cents a piece to enter this trade that brings the total all the way to a little over two million dollars what about this trade for apple they bought the 140 calls expiration date april 1st with expectation that apple would rise over seven percent by then and they paid about two bucks and 35 cents a piece to enter this trade that brought the total all the way to about four million dollars here's another interesting trade for the ticker psth this is for pershing square holdings and this is another spac with no deal yet there is no deal but it is all about speculations just like we saw with churchill capital yesterday on the speculations that churchill capital spac will merge with lucid motor in this case they're betting that bill ackman SPAC this time around will merge with something else. But he was a trader making a contrarian bet on Pershing Square holding, just like we saw the bearish bet against Churchill Capital yesterday. And of course, so far, that trade is not working out, but the trader has two days for that trade to go their way. We don't know if there is any pending news regarding SPACs or whether Lucid Motor will scrap the deal altogether. Who knows? And who knows what's going on with Pershing Square? 
Nobody knows anything. SPAC companies, empty shell companies with only promises to offer. Some will score big merger deals, but most will not. But here is the trade for Pershing Square. Somebody's buying the 25 puts expiration date April 16th with expectation that the name will decline over 22% by then and they paid about one buck and 85 cents a piece to enter this trade and that brought the total all the way to about 1.8 million dollars. And what about this trade? Very interesting for the ticker SOXS. This is the bearish ETF for the semiconductor ETF, meaning that this particular name appreciates if we see declines in semiconductor names. We saw declines today, but somebody is betting against the name, meaning that somebody is bullish on semiconductor names and betting that the momentum from the chip shortage will continue for the sector. And they're playing it by buying the nine puts expiration date March 19th with expectation that the SOXS will decline over 19% by then. And they paid about 45 cents a piece to enter this trade which brought the total all the way to about half a million dollars. Here's another interesting trade for the ticker QS, Quantum Scape. The technicals started to look bullish and we spotted that a few days ago and Quantum Scape reported earnings yesterday and of course their pre-revenue, there are no revenues to measure this company based upon. It is all about hopes and dreams and potential for now. And somebody's making a bullish bet here that the momentum we saw in Quantum Scape that started a few days ago will continue to go on for a little while. By buying the 70 calls expiration date February 26 with expectation that the name is going to climb over 5% by then and they paid about 6 bucks and 50 cents a piece to enter this trade that brought the total all the way to a little over 4 million bucks. Continuing with interesting trades, what about the ticker TRGP? This is for a company called Targa Resources. It's an oil and gas company company located in Houston, Texas. We know what's going on in Texas and the shortage of production pushing crude prices higher and helping all of these oil and gas exploration names. In this case, somebody's making a bullish bet, buying the 33 calls expiration date March 19th with expectation that the name is going to rally over six and a half percent and they paid about a buck and 25 cents a piece to enter this trade. And that brought the total all the way closer to 700 thousand dollars and what about the ticker l-o-d-e this is for a company called comstock mining and the name surged over 200 percent today and closed at about 150 percent gains and the reason is this is a miner of course they had a deal with a lithium battery recycler now the stock is trading at around six bucks a piece yet you saw a stampede in call options buying and some of those calls cost more than the price of the underlying stock, meaning that we could have another case of sundial growers in our hands. When I see stuff like this, what do I do? I buy the stock and I sell upside call options. And this is exactly what I did with Comstock mining stock today. When I saw the action, I bought the stock and I sold upside calls because the likelihood is that even if you see slight declines tomorrow in the next few days, the dip will be bought and the momentum will continue. You don't see a one day pop and then the momentum dies off. It usually carries on for a few days or weeks depending on the momentum of call options buying. But since the premiums are elevated, it is an opportunity to raise a lot of cash and even selling the stock at a sizable profit, exactly just like I did with Sandal Grower. In this case, we see put options being bought, we see call options being bought. I'll show you the call options example, but it doesn't matter. Buying calls or puts that will elevate the options premiums across the board for the name. And the reason is that the implied volatility for both the stock and the options rise higher and we know what dictates the value of an options. One of the factors is Vega. Vega is very sensitive to the implied volatility of the underlying stock. And here's an example. Somebody's buying the six bucks calls expiration date March 19th with expectation that the name is going to rally over 8% by then and they paid about two bucks a piece to enter this trade, which brings the total all the way to about $800,000. Here's another very interesting trade for the Qs, the NASDAQ. 
And pay attention here because the trader is very confident that the queues will decline further in the next few weeks and they're making a very, very bold trade. They are buying the 302 and a half puts expiration date March 26 with expectation that the queues will decline over 9.5% by then and they paid about 3 bucks and 25 cents a piece to enter this trade which brought the total to about 1.6 million dollars. But this is not what they paid because they've also decided to sell a call, an upside call, specifically the 354 expiration date March 19th, and they collected about a buck and 43 cents a piece. So the entry cost for the puts was about 1.6 million dollars. And now that they sold an upside call for one buck and 43 cents a piece, they collected about 700 thousand dollars. All in all, when you do the math, the entry cost for the trade is about 900 thousand dollars. And the trade is a little complicated because it is a bearish bet, but the trader is also opening themselves to a lot of risk if the queues rise higher significantly. And therefore, to mitigate that risk, they decided to sell the calls a little shorter than the expiration date of the puts they bought. And the bet here is the following, that even if the queues go against the trade and they rise higher instead, they will not have enough time to close above 354 by the expiration date of March 19th. But if the trade go their way and we see declines in the queues, the call leg that they sold will expire worthless and the 700 plus thousand dollars they were credited for selling those calls will be pocketed thus reducing the entry cost reducing the risk of the trade and maximizing the potential of turning this trade to becoming profitable this is a very intelligent construction and it tells me that the trader is a very experienced trader because they know the risk versus reward and they wouldn't sell calls naked unless they are very confident that the direction for the queues will be to the downside in the next few weeks Moving on to the headlines that shape the day, starting with macro news. And right away, we received the retail sales data in the morning, and it was a blowout. Retail sales surged 5.3% in January versus 1.2%. That is the estimate. Why did we see a massive surge in retail sales in January? We know that the retail sales data that were received for December, which is supposed to be the hottest months for retail sales, was actually a lot tamer than expectations. Meanwhile, the January sales data, which is supposed to be one of the slowest months, blew past any expectations. The reason is, you guessed it, surprise, surprise, the STEMI money. Retail sales burst higher in January as consumers use stimulus checks to spend heavily. And here are the details. Department stores, spending was up over 23.5%. Electronics, up 14.7%. E-commerce, up over 11%. Eating and drinking, up almost 7%. Gas stations, up 4%. Food and beverage, up 2.5%. 4% massive massive amount of spending due to the STEMI money the problem is giving people a handout in the stimulus checks will stimulate the economy momentarily in the months of January but the majority of the STEMI money will go into savings and will not be spent in the economy and we will see a retreat once again this economy is still on life support and it is very dependent on more stimulation via monetary and fiscal stimulus the economy will not be able to stand on its feet until we have a successful reopening and we see a deployment of all the savings into consumer spending in the economy but it is also an illustration that perhaps we already have stimulus in the economy and issuing a new round of stimulus is not needed because a lot of that stimulus money by the way also went into the stock market and this is why we saw massive gains for stocks in january and if we continue to cut more checks you will see a lot of that money go into department stores electronics that is the good part but it will also go into the stock market speculation mania and it could overheat the stock market and the economy overall before we even have a reopening and of course, we see increasing calls on the Biden administration to issue the stimulus in a targeted way for those who need it the most, those who needed to pay 
outstanding bills, those who are waiting in lines for food banks begging to be fed. Those are the people who deserve and need the stimulus, specifically if they lost their jobs and their income due to the shutdowns. But throwing the money out of the helicopter all over the place, are you wondering why we have inflation in the economy before we even started the reopening phase? Are you surprised why we're having extreme speculation mania in the stock market of course not like i said there is a price to pay for all of this stimulus that's going on in the economy number one and this is the obvious we're racking more debt for the next generation to deal with but the most immediate consequence is a rise in inflation and we are talking about unwanted inflation because you're giving the money to both the haves and the have-nots the haves are either saving the money or spending it in the economy, causing inflation. While we have not recovered the employment picture yet, raising inflation before the reopening phase is leading to higher inflation. Meanwhile, those who are unemployed, even if they join the working force after the reopening phase, they will be underpaid. Their wages will not be pinned to the rise of inflation and they will find themselves in a worse situation than they were sitting at home receiving government checks because whatever paycheck they're going to receive from working will be diminished in terms of purchasing power due to the rise of inflation. All of this will lead to a phenomena called stagflation. This is what happens when you have incompetent morons engineering the direction of the economy. The haves have a lot of money in their savings, a lot of pent up demand. They will go spending like a drunken sailor once the economy reopens. Meanwhile, the have nots have a lot of catching up to do. However, the environment around them, prices around them, have been already inflated by the haves in our society. Continuing with macro news, yet on the same theme of inflation. Here it is the PPI data much stronger than expected at 1.7% year over year versus 0.9%, that is the estimate, and 0.8%, that is the prior month. So we're seeing a massive surge here in PPI, the producer price index, yet another leading indicator that inflation is rising higher. In addition, we received the industrial production data in the morning. Here it is, January industrial production beat estimates at 0.9% versus 0.4%, that is the estimate, and the reading of 1.3% in the prior month. So we are seeing industrial production starting to build up some momentum. If you remember from my video a few days ago, we talked about the M2 money supply and why we have haven't seen significant rise of inflation in the economy even though the surge in M2 money supply is pretty much cartoonish when you look at the chart. And of course we're talking about the official Federal Reserve data. We are aware that inflation is already rising around us. We know that but we're talking about the Federal Reserve's formula. While the M2 money supply surged higher, the velocity of money has not recovered yet. Today, we received two indicators, very important ones, that the velocity of money is starting to recover. And that is all what we need for inflation to skyrocket higher. The industrial output and retail sales data, both indicators that the velocity of money is recovering and we will see a massive surge in inflation. Add to that another round of stimulus and the whole thing will blow up from overheating. More news regarding inflation. U.S. inflation expectations are outpacing those in the euro area by the most in over a decade. European countries are still in lockdown and they're not receiving the same amount of cocaine. And when we say cocaine, we're talking about monetary and fiscal stimulus to the same magnitude we are receiving here in the United States. And to illustrate that for you, we received data regarding car sales in Europe. Here's the headline. Car sales in Europe slump a record low for January. We saw Europe car sales 
falling about 26% last month, and that is the steepest drop since May of 2020. Among the continent's biggest car makers, sales for VW fell 28%, while Renault were down 23%. Luxury automakers fared better, with registrations dropping 18% for Daimler and 17% for BMW. So they're still experiencing a K-shaped recovery over in Europe. However, the fact that we are out pacing Europe in inflation doesn't mean that we are recovering better because we're racking more debt, causing more inflation, and we're only kicking the can down the road. We still have a massive, massive eviction crisis on our hands. Once all of the evictions moratoriums expire, what will happen to people who are behind on rent? Are they going to end up in the streets? Becoming homeless? This is the next bomb to deal with. But make no mistake, our government, our economy, and our market, they're all zombies, dead zombies addicted to the cocaine, fiscal and monetary liquidity. Without that, without the continuous supply of fiscal and monetary liquidity, the whole charade will fall down in an instant. On what about the stock market mania? We know that a lot of students are gambling via the tuition money. They're buying call options on Robinhood and they are very comfortable taking more and more risk, gambling via margin, borrowing. And when you talk to them, they will say, oh, Uncle Joe is going to cancel student debt. So we don't need the tuition money anymore. We're just going to gamble on Robin Hood with that tuition money. Here is Uncle Joe. I will not cancel 50,000 bucks of student loans. There you go. Don't gamble with the tuition money. And by the way, I received a lot of questions specifically from new investors and traders who are still confused. Why would the stock market drop if we see a rise in the 10-year treasury yields? Why would specifically growth stocks suffer the most you know the clowns over at cnbc they're usually pumping stocks talking nothing but gibberish but this time around this guy who's usually a clown said something very important so i will let him explain it for you hey scotty it was a composite <laughs> sentence i said it's clear sailing for now but yeah. look out for higher interest rates and higher taxes I mean, listen, it is clear sailing when you look at earnings, but let me be super clear so that when we come back to this, we know exactly what we're talking about. One and a half percent on the 10 year, you've got a problem in the stock market, period. Why? Because take a look at the earnings yield. If you take an Apple, a Microsoft, a Facebook, a Google at 30 times earnings, that's a 3.3 percent uh, earnings yield. That's right where it's supposed to be if the, if the 10 year is one percent. If the 10 year is one and a half percent and you add the equity risk premium of about two and a half percentage points, that gives you an earnings yield of 4%, which means the PE on those stocks should be 25, not 30. And that's a good 12% lower than we are now. That's not a crash, but it's a correction. So yeah, it's clear sailing, but until you get to one and a half percent on the 10 year, this market will go through a correction. That's the thing to look out for. I don't know. Steph said embrace Jim, higher rates. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was just going to say, Jim, what if GDP comes in at 7% this year? What if earnings actually come in up 30% this year? That means that, the, that rates are going up, as Scott said before, for the right reasons. And of course, Stephanie here is saying, but, 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 the recovery is going well, but, 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 her argument is... Yes, yields are rising, but they're rising for the good reasons. Take a look at the retail sales data. Take a look at all the stuff that we received in the morning. What she's not factoring here is, you heard it from Jerome Powell himself, admitting that the real unemployment rate is probably over 10%. And all of the good, quote-unquote good, macro data that we are receiving is due to the impact of the stimulus, meaning that that will wear off once we run out of stimulus. And that right away tells you the yields are rising not due to the rise of quote-unquote good inflation, but they're actually rising due to the fear of bad inflation. Good inflation means that wages are rising higher and we're seeing very low unemployment. And of course, that only lasts for a little while before prices rise higher and higher and higher and thus eroding the purchasing power 
of consumers, even though their wages are rising higher. And then good inflation morphs into bad inflation. What if I told you that the current inflation we're having right now is already starting on the wrong foot? It's already starting as bad inflation because we have not recovered the unemployment picture. Wages are not going higher. Companies are not hiring. Meanwhile, prices are rising every single day, higher and higher and higher. And we do have a wealth inequality gap where the haves part of society have a lot of pent up demand via the savings rate. Meanwhile, the have nots don't have any purchasing power and they are dependent on government hands outs. Meaning that we're already starting the so-called inflation on the wrong foot, which will lead to a stagflation phenomenon. Continuing. Because all of this stimulus, it takes a while to get into the system. It usually takes about 12 months. And so we're 11 months into this thing. And certainly some parts of the economy have benefited from the stimulus, but not all. And so you are going to see better growth rates. And I think that's what the bond market is telling you at this point. And all, by the way, I think it's also telling you that there's a little bit more inflation than we expected. I certainly expect more inflation. My portfolio is certainly well, positioned Steph. for more inflation ahead. <clears throat> Steph, you and I normally see things eye to eye. Sometimes we differ, and here's where we differ right now, is I think those growth rates are absolutely priced into the markets right now. I think that, third, you know, we're looking at S&P 500 operating earnings of 175 this year, 192 next year. That gives you about a 22 and a half multiple on the market overall right now on this year's earnings. And what I'm saying to you is I think the market has priced in those growth rates that you're talking about. Now, look, from here, we're at 127 on the 10-year, okay? Well, it's still a ways to go to 1.5%, but I just don't think that we can justify the same multiple at 1.5% that we justified at 125. Jim, you said we're a week at ago it was 115, or three months ago it was 1%. And there you go. The higher yields go, the lower multiples have to go specifically for the high growthy names but rest assured that the federal reserve is still on their propaganda tour we heard from uh, bullard and today we heard from the boston fed rosengren would be surprised if there is a sustained inflation rate that hits the fed's two percent target within the next year or two well if you have a bullshit formula that is by design never going to go over one and a half percent then of course you're not going to hit two percent target within a year or two but real inflation is rising by the day and the 10-year treasury yield is also rising and in essence giving the mid finger to the federal reserve and saying how about it now you pieces of shit commodity prices still skyrocketing higher rent prices will go higher and higher and oh boy wait till you see rent prices after we reopen the economy, it will skyrocket even higher than they are right now. What about home prices? All-time highs. The Federal Reserve's solution to combat inflation is doing propaganda. Lie and deny, deny, deny. And here it is, more propaganda. The honest, and I actually should read anus, because this is where they're pulling it from, should be on anybody who says the economy is about to overheat said ahead of the Obama, Obama rather, era Council of Economic Advisors. There have been many prominent voices saying that there was about to be inflation for more than 10 years. Would somebody for the love of God throw a bucket of water on the face of this moron and wake him up from sleep? When did we have a pandemic in the last 10 years? When did we have the massive surge in money supply in the last 10 years? It happened in a very short period of time but this is the propaganda tour the new york times releasing a massive article today saying that biden and the fed leave the 1970s inflation fears behind this is all psychological propaganda to make you and me have the illusion that inflation is not rising and our fears regarding inflation are misplaced and this drives us back to the very confused fed the federal reserve is a very very confused organization a few months ago they told us that they need to see inflation rising higher they have a target of one percent and they don't mind that inflation would rise even more than two percent for a little while to recover the employment picture in the economy now that we're seeing unwanted inflation all of a sudden they're trying to play this game of retreating and saying no there is no inflation we're not worried about it and it's not gonna rise as we told you it would before what a bunch of donkeys 
leading the Federal Reserve. And these are unelected people that are making decisions on our behalf. Critical decisions, I might add. Here is more in market sentiment. What about the junk bond mania? Yields on top-rated junk bonds have fallen below 3% for the first time. Unbelievable. Absolutely unbelievable. The stampede in buying junk bonds garbage bonds is stunning and they're all doing it under the assumption that oh papa jerome got our back papa jerome played the psychology game of luring you to go to stampede into buying junk bonds but he's not buying anything right now he's just giving you his word that he will have your back ask yourself a question would the federal reserve buy junk bonds at these levels right now these are supposed to be the high yield bonds and they're only paying three percent and now you have the risk-free rate in the 10-year Treasury yield rising higher and higher. And it's just a matter of time before it reaches 1.5%. And if we see the stampede and the mania continuing in junk bonds, perhaps by the time the 10-year Treasury yield is at 1.5%, junk bonds will be yielding at 2% to 1.5%. But what's going to happen then? The slaughter will be on an epic scale. And Papa Jerome will be nowhere to be found. Why would I hold junk bonds at this rate when the risk-free rate is almost matching the garbage rate? Here is more. The lowest rated debt keeps outperforming safer securities, with investors apparently more concerned about treasury yields moving higher than credit risk because they're morons. Investors are now demanding the extra yield to own junk bonds over investment-grade notes since 2014. And here is Jim Bianco talking about inflation and the whole junk bond mania. Although Bianco says that he's not worried about inflation right now in the immediate term, he thinks that the panic will take place during the second half of the year. I agree with a lot of the comments before that inflation is percolating, but we got the built-in excuse that the economists call the base effect because we're going to drop off the big fall in prices in April and in May, so everybody's going to look past it. But once they get sticky in the back half of the year, I think that's going to be a problem. What's the Fed do? The Fed is going to do what they did the last two cycles. They're going to give a bunch of wonky speeches that says, we're going to let it run hotter, 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 just like Guy said. And then the market's going to throw a fit, and then they're going to be forced to respond. That's what happened in 2018 when they tried to taper too much. Remember, it was automatic pilot, watching paint dry, market threw a fit, Paul jettisoned that in within 10 days. A year ago, they said, we're going to stay at one and a half forever, the market tanked on pandemic talk, and within 10 days, it cut 50 basis points. That's what will happen this time. Rates will keep going up, 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 and then we'll get to a point where the market throws a fit because they're so worried about inflation, and the Fed will be forced to respond no matter what they say. This is how it seems to be working lately. Okay, so, so that means that you believe that inflation will, in fact, go hotter than expected because the Fed will be painted into a corner um, into not acting. Is that, am I understanding that right? Yeah, you're right. absolutely. The Fed is not going to act. Yeah. We're going to look past it right now and say it's all good, it's reflation, and it's going to keep going and going. And then in the second half of the year, I think it'll probably be a problem. So it's not an immediate problem for the markets. I don't think that rising rates, you know, this week, next week, into the, in the, the summer, is going to necessarily be a problem for the market. They'll find a way to look past it. But as we continue on and that base effect that everybody's looking for doesn't go away, and that's what I think happens, then I think it becomes a problem after that. Hey, Jim, so what, what about the credit side of this story? Because uh, junk bonds and junk issuance and the concerns we had about a uh, essentially a, a triple B minus tranche two years ago taking the world into a credit crisis is now only more of a bubble. I mean, is this, is this part of the same... Uh, the same sequence of events that just doesn't really have to be an issue until we get into the fourth quarter? Or is this something that, that actually could be a risk and there could be some type of a trigger before then? You know, back in the spring last year, the, the word that everybody used was co-invest with the Fed. The Fed had backstopped the high yield market. They were buying high yield bonds or buying high yield ETFs. You can't go wrong buying what the Fed's buying. Now they stopped doing it, but everybody expects that that backstop is still there. So as long as you don't have inflation, the corporate market is going to keep running because everybody thinks that they've got a protection on the downside. It's only when you get inflation that kind of forces the Fed's hand to not be aggressive in throwing money at these markets that there will be a rethink. 
So yeah, corp a high yield is under four percent right now. Uh, double B high yield is uh, is approaching um, you know the low threes at this point. It's incredible these yields. We used to call it high yield, and it's we have to find a new name for it right now. But this will continue because of that perceived Fed backstop. You know, Jim, just to follow on that on that thought, you know, a year ago we were talking about fallen angels. Um, and, and this year, we might be looking at the fastest upgrades from junk status to, co- to investment grade status that we've seen in, in credit history. And I'm wondering what you think the impact of, of that is, because the flip side to a heating up economy is that companies are in better shape. Their business is theoretically better and they could actually see upgrades and that could change uh, how investors view junk. That could change how investors view investment grade. Yeah, I, you're right that we are seeing that because these companies have been given a, a lifeline that they're being able to issue debt and they've been able to get enough cash to kind of get over the other side of the pandemic. But don't forget, on the other side, we've got a lot of zombie companies that are still alive that shouldn't be alive right now that are kind of hanging on a, as well, too. So we've got a lot of companies that are in the pipeline that when we get a turn in the credit cycle, there can be problems with these zombie companies hmm. and these other companies that have, have issued money. You know, I'm thinking like the theme parks that have issued money and are basically burning cash waiting for them to open the theme parks. They could run into trouble on the other side once, if the credit cycle turns before the reopening happens. Ah. And by the way, what about the maestro himself, Alan Greenspan? He was what he said. Too many are underestimating the risk of a rise in inflation. Alan Greenspan predicted that inflation would eventually have to rise, calling the Fed's balance sheet a pile of tinder. The pandemic could well be the lighting strike that ignites it. Do you hear that, bullshitter, head of the Obama-era council of economic advisors, even Alan Greenspan is spitting some truth. What about the penny stock mania? All-time highs, the average trading volume in penny stocks, garbage stocks, now averaging at 100 billion daily trading volume. Unbelievable, but here is more. What about the crypto mania? Here is this donkey who's been pumping Bitcoin over and over and over. Here's what he says. I need to sleep. But how the hell do you sleep when you're watching history unfold? And he is talking about Bitcoin surpassing 50 grand. Here's the thing. If you are making an investment, if you are an investor, not a gambler, and you are making a solid choice, you did the research, you did the due diligence, and you made an investment decision, You go sleep like a baby. What you don't do is staying up all night, refreshing the page of Bitcoin prices and futures prices. That is a sign of anxiety. That is a sign of gambling, not investing. Because at the back of your head, you are worried about a drop in Bitcoin, a significant one. Why the hell would you stay up and lose sleep when the trade is going your way? Classic sign of gambling. And here's uh, Rubini, and they call him Dr. Doom. Why is he Dr. Doom? Just because he told you something you don't agree on? Economist Rubini says the Flintstones had a better monetary system than Bitcoin, and the token should not be considered a currency. And he's talking about shells. The Flintstones used to use shells as a trading currency. That is more valuable than Bitcoin, according to Rubini. But what is this amateur knows anyways? We... We, the Robin Hood idiots and the crypto maniacs, we know the future. And the future isn't even Bitcoin, it's Dogecoin. And here it is. North Korean hackers charged in massive cryptocurrency theft scheme. Wait till this donkey who's staying up all night fall asleep during the trading session only to wake up in the afternoon only to find out that Kim Jong-un stole all of your gains. Here's another illustration of the mania. And this is the Elon culties, of course. Elon Musk tweets he is using Clubhouse. Shares of an unrelated Clubhouse media <laughs> surged 1,200%. We saw the same phenomena when Elon Musk tweeted about Signal. And the moron stampeded to buy a company called Signal, which is totally unrelated to the app. Doesn't matter. They're zombies high on meth looking for the next score. They're not investors. They're not traders. They're not even gamblers. They're zombies high on meth. And their diet is tickers. Just throw a ticker out there. Doesn't matter what it is. And they will stampede to buy it. And this is why I'm proposing to create the horse manure futures. We give Elon 50% stake. He pumps it on Twitter. 
and the zombies will stampede to buy horse manure futures. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter what you sell them. Toxic waste, dog shit, used tampons. It doesn't matter. They'll buy whatever Elon Musk or Shamath throws at them. They just need a ticker. But some are blowing the whistle and sounding the alarm. And uh, of course, we're talking about this guy. Remember this guy, Slimy Mnuchin, who was pumping stocks day in and day out? Well, now that he's not in the administration, here he is. Mnuchin says stocks are priced at very, very high multiples. Or oh, you think, Mnuchin? Who created this garbage? Who created this jungle? It is you and your cronies in the Federal Reserve. Moving on to some corporate-specific news, starting with Berkshire Hathaway. We talked about the positioning for Berkshire yesterday, and of course, a lot of donkeys will come up on TikTok and the likes, and they will say, oh, look, Warren Buffett is buying. Be uh, greedy when others are fearful. Moron, I just showed you yesterday. Only 13% of money managers, these are the professionals, the smarty pants, only 13% think that we are in a bubble. Is this fear to you? But it doesn't matter. The zombies, they saw that Warren Buffett is buying some value names like Chevron and Verizon. And now they're convinced that it is a good opportunity to continue to stampede and buy the riskiest names. Meanwhile, here is the fact. Buffett is back to hoarding cash while riding out a market that has been disjointed by a global pandemic, steep valuations, and better Reddit users. Berkshire Hathaway is sitting on a mountain of cash. They're not really doing a lot of buying when you look at their whole portfolio. They're sitting on a massive amount of cash because they cannot find value anywhere. It's even getting more difficult to find value within the value section of the market. What about Ford? Ford targets move to an all electric passenger vehicles in Europe by 2030. Ford has turned into a momentum name, just like we saw General Motors back during the fourth quarter of last year. I continue to own the name, and I think there is more upside for Ford here, and Ford has the advantage over General Motors or even Tesla due to the credits that consumers will receive buying EVs from Ford versus other competitors. Speaking of EVs, here's the Hyundai 2022 Kona Electric, and it features a simpler, smoother design. It kind of looks like a Tesla if you ask me, but anyways, who cares? Moving on to Tesla itself. And here it is. Texas Freeze raises cost of charging at Tesla to 900 bucks. Listen, you get a Camry Hybrid, the top-notch class. It is better for the environment than a Tesla, and it costs you about 15 bucks to get the whole thing running. And of course, we're seeing this uh, debate on social media between green energy proponents versus fossil fuel proponents. And there are accusations back and forth regarding what's going on with the deep freeze in Texas. Because the natural gas output has been reduced significantly for understandable reasons. And the point was that EVs, solar, and windmills will be a replacement for fossil fuels. But what we saw is that all of these green energy initiatives are actually dependent on fossil fuels. And once we saw a shortage in oil and gas that also impacted the functioning of green energy, specifically EVs, and we saw windmills frozen being inoperational, in addition to, of course, solar units that become unusable when you have a snowstorm. So the whole Texas crisis, the deep freeze crisis, illustrated that we are far behind moving away from fossil fuels. Matter of fact, we are still dependent on fossil fuels even in our green energy initiatives. And that is, of course, emboldening energy investors and you're seeing energy names rising higher and higher and higher. Back to corporate specific news. What about Lockheed Martin versus Raytheon? Here it is. Raytheon plans to contest Lockheed Martin's takeover of Aerojet, a key supplier of rocket engines. Of course, once Lockheed bought Aerojet, now they have the upper hand in the whole space race, the Space Force fight. And if you need any rocket engines, you gotta kiss the ring of Lockheed Martin. Moving on to Big Pharma and the vaccine manufacturers, Pfizer and Moderna. Here it is. Executives and directors at Pfizer and Moderna and other companies developing COVID-19 vaccines sold nearly 500 million of stock last year. Doesn't sound fishy at all. Moving on to Robinhood and speak about fishy. Here it is. Robinhood missed the government deadline to provide customers 
with the 1099 forms they need to file their taxes. Of course, the Robin Hoodies have been scoring big the last year. Hold your horses, don't go out on a spending spree because Uncle Sam is going to eat a massive slice of your gains. And we know that Robin Hood is going to testify tomorrow in the congressional hearing regarding that whole fiasco with the GameStop. I'm going to have my big bag of popcorn and I will be watching how our imbecile politicians display their ignorance regarding the markets they're supposed to be regulating. Moving on to Wells Fargo. You saw shares of Wells rising higher even though we got the news yesterday from Berkshire Hathaway that they are cutting their stake in Wells Fargo by a lot. But here is the reason why Wells rallied today. Wells Fargo wins the Fed acceptance for overhaul plan tied to asset cap. And lastly, in corporate news, what about Google, specifically YouTube? YouTube will begin testing its answer to TikTok in the US starting next month. So I guess I have to prepare myself to do uh, dance videos for you guys while I'm reading the charts. And of course, YouTube is going to find another way to sucker punch content creators. They want to shove CNN and CNBC down your throat. Meanwhile, not rewarding the original content creators like us who are pouring our hearts out and we're not getting paid anything. We're getting paid breadcrumbs and chicken feed. Anyways, enough complaining and back to working. By moving on to the heat map analysis and let's see what happened today. We saw big declines here in the technology sector, even the very hot semiconductor names. They were down big. We're talking about TSM down over 2.7%. So did NVIDIA. Marvel was down almost 5% for the session. Declines for AMAC, LAM Research, etc. But the most important name to watch here is Apple. Apple was down almost 2% for the session. And I keep telling you that as Apple goes, so will the market. Even though we saw an outperformance here from Google and Amazon. What about the communication services sector? Gains for Verizon off the heels of the disclosure from Berkshire Hathaway. They're building a massive stake in Verizon. We saw the name rising over 5% today. AT&T also parasiting on the results from Verizon closing in the green by about 2% or so. We saw massive declines in the communication services sector for the high momentum names. We're talking about Zoom down over 3%. Airbnb down almost 4%, DoorDash down almost 7%, Twitter, Zillow, Twilio all declining by massive, massive gains. And the reason is here, we are starting to see money managers, specifically from the institutional side, taking the rise in yields a little more seriously. No notable action here for consumer defensives, real estate, or utilities. What about materials? The gains for copper go on. Freeport McMoran, another day and more gains this time around by about 3.8%. Meanwhile, the bulk of the pain is concentrated in gold names. Barrick Gold was down over 4% today. What about energy names? Gains for Chevron after the disclosure from Berkshire yesterday. We also saw continuation of the gains for Exxon, British Petroleum, ConocoPhillips, the energy sector, remains hot for now but we could reach some short-term exhaustion and i will talk about that a little more when i cover the dollar chart what about the healthcare sector once again the theme is very clear any name that warren buffett bought is benefiting today we saw buffett raising his stakes in AbbVie, Merck, and Bristol-Myers. All of these names gained almost 2% apiece for the session. But what about financials? Yields were stable today. We did not see a massive surge, just like we saw yesterday. Yet we saw modest gains here for financials. The winner is Wells Fargo closing over 5% in the green due to the news I just covered a few minutes ago. All right then, the theme is very clear today. Muted activities tilted to the red, and the benefactors for the day were the names the Berkshire Hathaway bought or raised their stake in. Moving on to the charts analysis. What do we see here? Starting with a SPY 15 minutes chart. We talked about the bear flag yesterday. The bear flag played out. We gapped lower. We caught support from where? The same trend line from the previous wedge consolidation. We caught support not once but twice and then we continued to rally higher and higher and higher on autopilot all the way till the end of the session. We had a gap open from yesterday at 392.35 and the official close today came out at 392.39 meaning that we have officially closed the gap from last night but the movement remains inconclusive. It doesn't tell us one way or the other whether we're going to trend higher or lower and for that 
were zooming out to the daily chart of the continuous contract of the SPY. The bull flag formation remains intact. Nothing happened whatsoever. We're still seeing a bull flag formation. The bullish case remains supreme for now. But there are alarm signals from the lower divergence in the RSI and the fact that we are struggling to close above the highs from yesterday's trading session. Too early to make a bearish conclusion. What about the Qs, the Nasdaq? 15 minutes chart. Once again, we saw the bear flag formation yesterday that played to the downside, gapping lower, and then we saw the autopilot buying and we closed above the highs of the session. Yet short of recapturing the trend, short of closing the gap, unlike what the SPY did, so the Qs remain weaker when you pin it against the SPY. What about the bigger picture from the daily chart of the continuous contract of the NASDAQ? The bull flag formation remains intact. We pierced below the support level of 13,599, but we managed to recapture it and close above it. For now, the bullish picture remains on the table. Are there any warning signals? Yes, there are. Take a look at the RSI. We're still showing negative divergence, signaling a weakening in momentum. Add to that the performance of Apple today, and you could be building a bearish case against the NASDAQ. Moving on to the IWM small caps from a 15 minutes chart perspective. Once again, a bear flag from yesterday playing to the downside, gapping lower. We have attempted to recapture the trend over and over and over again, met with failure and a rejection. And you saw the flush down in the IWM early in the morning. But once the autopilot buying was released, the IWM also managed to pick up rising higher and higher and higher all the way to the end of the session. Needless to say, the IWM looks a lot weaker than the SPY. And there is a good reason for that. The Qs, the IWM, they will get hurt as we see the rise of yields higher and higher. Meanwhile, the SPY includes financial names. The financial sector is a massive part of the formation in the SPY. If yields continue to rise higher, that might hurt technology names, but it will benefit financial names, all in all, you will see the blow to the SPY a lot softer than the NASDAQ or the IWM. Zooming out to the daily chart of the IWM, what do we see here? We're back in the trading range once again, and we have broken the upward trend of momentum in the RSI. We broke it once, and I told you the damage has been already done. Now we have broken it again, and all we need is another confirmation from the candles themselves. We need to see the IWM going to a gap lower and then failing to rise higher once again, closing one of those gaps, but not bouncing higher. That would be a classic reversal signal from a candles perspective. What about the rut, the Russell 2000? The big picture remains intact. It's a bull flag formation. Is there a negative divergence in the RSI? Yes, there is. Is there a loss of momentum? Yes, there is. But for now, you take the charts as they're looking at you. And looking at the charts, I see a bull flag formation that is supposed to play to the upside. Until and unless I see a reversal signal, I am not placing a short on the IWM. Once we have a confirmation, then I will be buying the TZA once again. What about the dollar? Tricky Dixie. Last week, playing dead, playing possum with a bear flag formation, only to bounce higher, sucking all the shorts in, forcing them to cover. We saw a gap higher in the dollar index today, and we have recaptured the upward trend in the RSI, signaling that perhaps we have not lost all the momentum in the dollar index yet. Now, here is the take. The dollar index rose significantly today, hand in hand with a surge in oil prices. That doesn't usually make sense, but we know that there is an exception here regarding the events going on in Texas right now. But if we continue to see the dollar rising higher and the weather warming up once again in Texas and the supply resuming, we're talking about oil, of course, perhaps it is worth it to buy some put options calling a short-term top in the run for energy. It's a short term top. This is exactly what I did today buying put options for the XOP. Not a significant investment, but playing a short term top on the run for energy. What about gold? What's going on here with gold? Look at how they massacred my boy, breaking the support of 1800. And now we're looking at 1765 as the next destination. So many factors running against gold at the same time. The dollar is rising higher. Yields are rising higher. And the mania in Bitcoin getting hotter and hotter by the day. No love for gold whatsoever right now. Is it a buying opportunity? 
Not for me at least, I am a spectator watching the show. Until we see a massive drop in Bitcoin, the momentum for gold remains dead. What about the 10 year treasury yield, the TNX? Another move higher, closing at 1.3%. It's a massive move, it is catching a lot of attention and you guys heard the FOMC meeting, they are trying to play it down and we will see more efforts from the Fed to try to manipulate yields lower. The question is, looking at the chart, have we reached a short-term top in yields? The daily candle is showing indecisiveness, going higher, going lower, and then pretty much closing where trading started. But make no mistake, the macro data we received today should be pushing yields higher and higher. It's a battle between the facts versus the Fed's manipulation attempts. Moving on to the VIX, what do we see here? The bear flag formation remains from a technical perspective, even though the VIX managed to close just slightly higher. Now, here is an idea. If you are bidding on higher volatility due to the rise in treasury yields, which will impact the NASDAQ more negatively than it would impact the SPY, the VIX itself and its proxies track the put options activities against the SPY. Yet there is a new product called the VXN and this is the volatility index for the NASDAQ itself. So if the bid is that we will see a surge higher in treasury yields in the next few days and weeks, then that would hurt the NASDAQ proportionally higher than the SPY. Meaning that if you're buying volatility, bidding on the demise of the NASDAQ, you're better off buying the VXN instead of other traditional VIX proxies. Just an idea to think about. Moving on to Apple, what do we see here? Struggling to close above the support of 131. Technically closing at 130.84. We'll call it inconclusive for now. We got two more days before closing the week. If Apple closes the week below 131, then it is a confirmation that the tide is turning against Apple. We saw Berkshire dumping. A lot of money managers are now dumping following the steps of Berkshire Hathaway. And the reason is, they know that the treasury yield is rising higher and that would hurt the technology sector. Apple is the poster boy for the tech sector. Furthermore, a lot of money is concentrated in Apple. It will be treated as an ATM to raise cash. So we're waiting for the weekly close here, but Apple is starting to look very, very bearish. And remember, as Apple goes, so will the market, specifically the NASDAQ. Moving on to Tesla. Tesla going back all the way to the trend line I have been talking about for days, if not weeks. Catching support almost to the penny from the line and bouncing higher. So are we seeing a short term bottom for Tesla? We certainly witnessed call options buying midday that managed to recover Tesla shares and pushing it higher all the way to the positive territory. And that coincided, by the way, with an interview on CNBC with uh, Tesla witch Kathy Woods, who was pumping the stock and said that she is buying more of Tesla at these prices. And perhaps that is all the support needed for option traders to start buying calls on Tesla. And we might see a short-term bottom here. But the technicals remain weak from a momentum perspective, whether you're talking about the RSI, the MACD, the low volume, even the options volumes remain muted. So we're still watching the action in the options market. But for now, we could see a short-term bottom here for Tesla. I still have puts in the name. And if we have a bounce on a lower volume, lower options volume, what I will do is buy more puts. And now moving on to conclude this video. Tomorrow we have the usual jobless claims, the weekly claims that is. Suppose the number comes a little better than expected and we see the jobless claims are actually being produced due to the reopening in some areas in California, etc. That could add more inflationary pressure in the market, pushing yields a little higher. We are now entering a new era of the market. It's not really an era, it's a stage. And in this stage, bad news is good news, and good news is bad news. Why is that? Good news will solidify that inflation is rising and the recovery is going on pace. This is exactly what the Federal Reserve wanted, meaning that good news will eventually lead the Federal Reserve to have no choice but to taper their bond purchasing program. At least this is the rationale. Meanwhile, if we continue to see bad news, that will mean that the Fed's foot will remain on the pedal and the market will rejoice. Why is that? Because, say it with me, 
the market is a cocaine addict. That is the only thing that the market cares about, fiscal and monetary liquidity, more and more and more. The market cares less about whether the economy is recovering or not. And in this case, good news regarding the economy will be bad news for the market because the rational thinking is if the economy is indeed recovering and unemployment is dropping, then the Fed will get closer and closer to the quote-unquote exit strategy. But we're not supposed to talk about that, according to Jerome Powell. Next, what do we have in the earnings calendar? We have few important earnings, specifically from Walmart, Trade Disc, Applied Materials, and Marriott. We know that the CEO of Marriott just passed away, so I don't know if they're going to report or not. But Walmart is the name to watch here along with AMAT because AMAT has been surging higher like a maniac. So they better show some results tomorrow. With that being said, that's all I got for you for this video. And I'll talk to you again tomorrow. If you found the information presented in this video helpful, please subscribe, press the like button, the notification button, and follow me on social media.